you guys have oh. so much chemistry from the weekend. I watched that whole game waiting for you guys to fight, and there were just like no boxing gloves even available at Wrigley. That's because he was too far Rigley. down there. He was trying to survive the flood that was happening down there. <laughs> oh, you guys did get some rain delay. Oh, we got a three hour rain delay. <laughs> And all I had the whole time was Ken in my ear going, I can add, I can add. When can I come on camera? We're like, Ken, we're in a rain delay. We got plenty of time. Scott, let me tell you the truth of what happened in the game. On air, AJ was fine. Nothing insulting or anything like that. Off air, right before I interviewed David Ross, and I will admit to getting on a higher step than David Ross to interview him. That's what I did to get eye to eye. AJ is having a conniption in the booth. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why'd you move steps? Why aren't you on the, on the right <laughs> step with him? And then Adam Amin, who was about my size, God bless him, he got in AJ's grill, man. It was great. He did. What, he, what does he call this you? This was all off the air, though. What does he call you? His short king? He short, calls you his short king. He calls king. us both short kings, yeah. Yes, exactly. He's like, Ken's my short king. So he, I understand. So this was, this was all going on, Scott, and then you know how it is. Welcome back to Wrigley Field, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know how it is. Yeah. Well, hail to the short king then, because we need a little help right now, Ken. So, and I know you talked about all-star rosters a lot on fair territory as well, including Tatis. So you can mix it all in here, but just wanted to start with Wander Franco and why the league needs to make sure a player like this is highlighted, even if fans and his peers don't recognize him. Well, it's not even a question. And in my mind, it's not even a question that he ultimately will be there. The issue was that they took eight infielders. Now, when I made up my mock all-star team the other day, I had 10 infielders, but ultimately the league took an extra catcher and an extra outfielder. So you're down to eight. It's really two at each position. And the two that were elected by both the players and fans at shortstop were Corey Seager and Bo Bichette. That left no place for Juan DeFranco. Now, Whit, we all love him. He benefited from being at a position where there really wasn't an obvious backup to Marcus Simeon. So he gets voted by the players as the backup second baseman. That's great. But to have an all-star game with Wander Franco not there and Whit Merrifield there, that's a little bit odd, as much as we all love Whit. And I think Whit would be the first to admit it. Ken, do they still do the extra guy fan vote thingy? No. That oh. is gone. Yeah. Yeah, because Why? Why? Yeah, that was my favorite way to get elected to the All-Star Game. <laughs> I'm not sure. It is a cool... Actually, I liked it, too. I don't want to say this 100% because I'm not positive, but I don't think so. I think that's it, guys. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think so, too. I haven't heard anything about it. And they, it kind of no. just like, went away under the radar where it disappeared. They, I mean, working for the league for years, we promoted the hell out of it. They were like, hey, guys, today all we're talking about is that extra vote. Let's get votes. And we'd be like, well, vote, vote. But maybe I don't it went love away the because they have two phases now. They have two right. phases of the fan voting, so it's a little bit elongated that way. Voting fatigue. Go ahead, Kratzy. No, I'll, all I really want to know is, Ken, did you buy AJ his dinner? <laughs> rain delay. Well, there was no dinner rain because delay. Of the rain delay. So yeah, yeah, and also, is, AJ, AJ sauntered into town a little late on Friday night, so he did not join us for dinner. Oh, I see. So AJ was late for the dinner that you did. were going to buy him, so now you don't owe him anymore. Well, truth be told, Eric, I didn't go to the dinner either. <laughs> <laughs> he was too busy interviewing Marcus Stroman for his trade trade recap. Which we'll get to, which yeah. we'll get to. I want to stay on All-Star for a sec, though, because I read the article late last night, and I know you talked about it on Fair Territory. Let's kick it around here for a moment, because you said you love hate. The Tati situation, actually, I pulled my favorite part here that I know these guys will like. It is still rare for, in the athletic, it is still rare for a player to openly criticize a teammate or rival who is caught using PADs. But when it comes to Tatis, I can picture players sitting at lockers, filling out their ballots and thinking, fuck this guy. <laughs> I thought that was a great line. Well, actually, from being in enough clubhouses over the years, I actually can picture that. And this is a very interesting situation and it jumped out at me last night when the selections were announced even more than Wander Franco. Tatis is one of the best players in the game. He is one of the most exciting players in the game. He is almost the definition of what you would want in an all-star game. He is, despite starting the season on April 20th because of his suspension, sixth in the National League in Fangraph's version of war. And like you, Scott, I'm not an all-war, all-the-time guy, but that is telling, especially because it's a cumulative metric, and he started late, and he's still up among the league leaders. But what stood out to me here was that as much as I would love to see him in the game in many ways, I also love that the players stood up 
and said, we're not having him. He was suspended. We don't like this. We're going to take, as reserves, Juan Soto, who was having a great year offensively for sure, Lourdes Gurriel Jr., and Nick Castellanos. You can make the case that Castellanos and Tatis are comparable. Castellanos having a great year. Lourdes Gurriel Jr. is not anywhere close to Tatis. I'm sorry. So it seems to me that the players here made a clear choice. And I applaud that choice because you know what? This is their game too. It's not just the fans who vote. It's the players who vote. And what they're saying here is you served your penalty. That's fine. But we're not going to have you in the All-Star game on our behalf just yet. Hey, uh, AJ or Kratz, if you were one of the current players in this situation, yep, I already see that. That's part of what we have here with this show. Kratz, you're shaking your head. If, if Tatis is doing what he's doing and deserves to be there, are you, you pe penalizing him? And would that continue, though? Like, does this continue for the players even after this year? Like, is he losing a popularity contest or you're just giving them a one-year punishment? The question, the question is always, is he still on it? The question is always, is it still like the whole like the whole like Wander Franco getting benched thing like that? I'm not I'm not voting against that. Good player, bad player, whatever. If Tatis is on the border, you question. Was he on it before? Is he really as a player, as a clean player? That's what you're, you're always questioning. So how long do you let it go? I'd vote him right away if he was my teammate. But he's not. There's 29 other teams that didn't yeah. vote him. Here's the thing. Exactly what Kratz just said. This is the one way that players who are clean can try to affect players who aren't clean. And it sucks because he probably deserves to be there. And he probably will end up getting there anyways because, again, when somebody gets hurt or whatever. But the players have a say in one thing, really, and one thing only, and that's their vote in the All-Star game. So they all stood up and said, no, we don't want him there. And they spoke. And that's a good sign. And, you know, will it change next year? I don't know. But he could also get ringworm again. <laughs> yeah. Um, by the oh, way, well done for popping off. Uh, visit candypop.com, uh, cookiecandypop.com, <laughs> and enter code FOULBALL for 20% off. And, and let's hey, keep rolling. What? Hey, you know, Tatis – got popped so it's perfect yeah that's why we picked it Boom. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. all right aj ask about stroman let's get to stroman you guys were ken, both since, there what's going on ken since i wasn't listening during the broadcast on saturday on fox <laughs> uh what did you say about marcus stroman possibly get traded um is he going to get traded is why is why haven't they extended him because for those who didn't tune in on saturday ken you had a great story about and i asked you man he's basically begging to stay so why is he not, why have they not approached this? Why have they not said, man, he's one of the best pitchers in the National League. We need this guy for a long term. Well, what I reported, AJ, and I'm sorry you weren't listening, but I said that the Cubs are not inclined to sign him to an extension before the trade deadline. And there are a few reasons for that. One, they don't know whether they'll be in contention or not. And if they're not in contention, yeah, they'll probably want to trade him. Two, their budget for next year hinges on how they finish this year. So they really don't know what their payroll is going to be in 2024. And three, perhaps most importantly, Marcus Stroman probably has 15 starts left for this season. And who knows what might happen in those 15 starts. Now, granted, if you really were intent on not having him become a free agent, yes, you'd look at this right now. But you'd be taking a risk, there's no question, just as you're taking a risk by letting this play out, right, and having him go to the open market. He wants to stay. He has made that clear. And he understands the team's position. He, when I talked to him, was not at all rancorous in any way. He basically said, listen, if it gets to that, I want to come back here as a free agent. I want the chance to do that. And hopefully everything will be good. So he's been through this before. He's been traded before. He's been a free agent before. But as we get closer to the deadline, one thing to keep in mind, I'm not sure everyone realizes this, he already has received a qualifying offer, so he cannot get another one. He got one from the Mets a couple of years ago. That means that the Cubs cannot get a draft pick for him if they lose him as a free agent. So if they're going to get anything from Marcus Stroman, it will be at the deadline, and they're going to have to take a hard look at their team and whether they believe their team is capable of an NL Central title. We'll see.
you said it just now as your number two point, and you also said it in the telecast. You, and I wrote it down before so I don't get it wrong. The Cubs budget will hinge on where they finish this year? What is that? Right, because, Eric, here's how that works. And don't shoot the messenger. But the Cubs, like all teams, base their payroll on the previous year's revenues. Their revenues will be much higher if they have a great run here and make the playoffs. If they collapse and if they trade off pieces in the second half and attendance falls in the second half, though it's always strong at Wrigley, then that's a different equation. And that's part of what is going on here. And we can all sit here and say the Cubs should just spend, but the Cubs also want to spend wisely. And they also know that the free agent class of starting pitchers for 2023-24 does not solely consist of Marcus Stroman. There'll be plenty of other starting pitchers available. Now, they're not going to sign Otani. I don't expect them to sign Urias. But Aaron Nola will be out there. Eduardo Rodriguez likely will opt out and be out there. And there will be others as well that I'm missing right now. So it's not all or nothing here. And clearly, they're going to need to spend to fortify their rotation if he leaves. No doubt. But here's the thing, Ken. When we talked to David Ross on Saturday... You were in there. What was the breaking news about Shohei Otani? He said he said they needed a they needed a strikeout guy and they needed a left-handed power guy. So I said you're trading for Otani, and he <laughs> said the breaking news was basically pressured into by AJ. AJ <laughs> led the witness, and he said Ross said that they needed a left-handed bat and a left-handed reliever, and sure they could use a left-handed starter too. And AJ said, well, that means you want Shohei Otani. And Ross, what is he going to say? Of course he wants Shohei Otani. Every team should want Shohei Otani, but he's not getting traded for one thing. And free agency, we'll see. As I said on the broadcast, hopefully you were listening to this part, AJ, no self-respecting large market team should be out of these sweepstakes. you got to dip your toe in the water, see if he wants to play for you. If he doesn't, fine, nothing lost, but... If he has a little glimmer in his eye about playing for your team, it's in Chicago or if it's in New York, wherever, you got to at least explore it. AJ, they don't want him. You said lefty pitcher. He's no, a no, right. no. Yeah, well, he said a lefty power bat. Right. Yeah. Said, and he said a he said a lefty reliever. But I was like, well, Shohei can get lefties out of the split. <laughs> right. So right. Show him. Mm. And he's like, yeah, we might take him also. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, here's my question off of that, Ken. We go from a minute ago saying that the Cubs will make decisions based on how much money they make this year, as if they should really be pinching pennies. They shouldn't be an organization like that. Right. Then we're talking about Otani. And I know there are plenty of Cubs fans that have said, hey, we're a dark horse candidate for him. We could get him, right? Wrigley, it's awesome. Go to Chicago, dominate the division. It's a historic franchise, all of that. How can that be a discussion if the Cubs are are worried about finances, the teams that that are going to go for Otani and and Trout was on with us on Friday and said, "Hey, listen, it's it's not going to be all about money because there are going to be plenty of teams that will offer him basically the world on that front. There's going to be more factors. Sure, I get it, but the Cubs need to be able to to play up here, like Yankees. You would think maybe Angels, Dodgers for sure, Mets maybe. Are are they going to be up here, or are these indications that they're not going to be at those kind of levels, like a top five payroll team?" Scott, it's a good question, but I am not linking one with the other. And I know what I said about Stroman, about how the budget will be determined by how they finish, but I almost think that for every team, Otani is in a separate category. Because not only is he a great player who will give you incredible performance, but he is a money-making machine all his own, right? You're gonna get benefits from merchandise sales, from sponsorships, from all kinds of things that no other player really could give you in the same way. So I understand your point, it's a good point, and it's a fair question to ask. And I don't even know if they'll be in on Otani. Maybe they won't, maybe they're not a self-respecting large market team that should be dipping their toes in the water. But to me, he is a separate entity altogether. Another team that might throw um, their hat in because they do with any big superstar, although they might want to chill a little bit because it's not working, the San Diego Padres. So another rough weekend, especially yesterday. I mean, you're like, oh, come back. And then they give it up to Tyler Stevenson um, later on in the game after the Tatis homer. So now they're, again, in a position where you're looking at them going, I feel like they're going to get going at some point. But it's, it's getting late pretty quickly. So first question on the Padres. 
Do you think that Juan Soto is capable of being traded for a second consecutive season at the deadline? I would say no, based on the comments of owner Peter Seidler this weekend to the San Diego Union Tribune. He said, we're not going to reverse course. And he said a number of other things as well, but he presented a very optimistic view of this season as it goes forward. He said, listen, we have half the season to play. I think things are going to be okay. The playoff odds right now are at about 22%. Here's the Seidler quote. I absolutely love that we have high expectations, and it's incumbent upon myself and our organization to make them higher and higher and higher. That's the kind of baseball I really believe we're going to play in the second half. You can't predict with precision anything. True enough, but that's a much different view than we've heard from Steve Cohen of the Mets, for example. So I don't see the Padres trading Soto. I don't see them taking it apart at all. What I do see them doing, perhaps, is adding. And A.J. Preller, as their general manager, he is good at adding. I don't know that he's so good at roster construction because we've seen this team, and it's incredibly flawed in many ways. But I don't expect, as Peter Seidler said, that they're going to change course in any way or shape or fashion. Well, I'm going to say and present you a trade because you said they're not adding, they're not tearing down. Who says no to a Cronenworth for Goldie with the salary swap in a trade? Hmm. Maybe the Padres say no to that because of the control. Cronenworth has this, I believe, an eight-year deal. I can't remember if it's seven or eight. And Goldschmidt is a free agent after next season. So Goldschmidt's the better player. There's no question about that. And Gronenworth has really struggled this year. But I don't see actually either team doing it. Because Cronenworth, for the, if you're the Cardinals, he's not a good enough bet right now. You're, you're looking at him and you're wondering, hey, how good is this guy? And Goldschmidt, we all love him. He's one of the best players in the game. He's also going to be 36 next season, 37 the year after that. Now, he keeps himself in incredible condition. If there's one guy I would bet on, it's him. But that said, we would have said that about Max Scherzer. We would have said that about Justin Verlander. They're a little bit older. I get it. And they're pitchers. But as you get into your late 30s, it's less of a good bet. Let's face it. And I'll add here because I was doing some homework for you while Kratzy threw out that rando trade. So it's seven years, 80 mil. It starts next year. So, yes, it's technically like seven and a half years of team control right now. Cronenworth as an 85 OPS plus this year. He's having a a, a very down year. And I know there are at least some Padres fans are like, it's been cool to spend, but did we need to extend someone like this right now? Because there were still multiple years of control. Right. The answer answer was no. no. They went off. They they did not have to do that. Yes. Right. So it actually could be a bad contract. It's not like we have this super long sample size. He's been a good hitter the past few years, a little above average, but He's having a pretty down season. I don't think the Cardinals take on a contract like that right now. And he's playing first base, which diminishes his value further because he doesn't hit like a first base, but never did even when he was going well. So, yeah, I'm with you, Scott. I don't think the Padres would even want to do it, and I certainly don't think the Cardinals would. But where else are they going to change? They have to make changes, and he was the only guy that I picked out of the, picked out of the hat of the everyday players. Where's the change going to happen? I don't know that they want to change. If you read the owner's comments, he likes his team. He thinks this team is going to perform better. And whether he's blindly optimistic or prescient on this front, they're going to find out. And I just don't see them doing anything major. Their big free agents are on the pitching side. Blake Snell is one. Josh Hader is another. If they wanted to kind of retool and take some things apart, but they're not going to do that, again, based on what Seiler says. Now, The qualifier is if they go south further in the next month and it just looks that much more bleak, I would imagine they'd have to entertain it. But that is not the mindset of this organization. Ken, who's more optimistic, Cohen or the Padres owner? The Padres owner. It's not even close. Really? He's acting like the first half didn't even happen. And it happened. Steve Cohen? Oh, I know. Steve Cohen, though. No, no, he's not. Oh, well. I mean, he's no, like Steve a, Cohen has said, he has said, if we have to sell, we will sell. And if I have to pick up money in these deals, I will pick up money. So he, in my view, is being much more realistic than Seidler. Now, it's all words. And at this time of year, there's only so much stock you can put in words anyway. It's actions that matter, especially at this time of year. But 
At the same time, if you listen to Cohen's news conference last week and what Seiler told the San Diego Union Tribune, two totally different outlooks. Okay, so Seiler just thinks they're having a bad three months. Essentially, yes, that's what he was saying. Wow. I mean, I wish I had money to play with like that and I could look at it and say, oh, we just had a bad three months. Don't worry about it. We're under 500. We're in fourth place. And <laughs> I don't think we're catching the Dodgers, Diamondbacks, or Giants. But we'll just keep spending. Yeah, yeah. sign me up. I, I'm going to go back and play for him, please. <laughs> But, AJ, that's what fans want to hear. I mean, fans don't want to sell right now. No, but fans are also realistic. They're not – they don't – They don't Unrealistic. They don't want – Yes. No, fan, <laughs> fans are realistic. They don't buy the bullshit. Most of them. Now, some do because they just want to buy it. But most fans are, are, are real. They look at it and say, okay, we're under 500. We're 81, 82, 83 games in. And realistically, we don't have a chance of winning the division because there's too many teams to jump. And nobody, I don't know. I mean, I guess Wild card, though, dude. Here's the yeah, better question if you're a Padres fan. Here's the question I'd be asking. Do I want to trade another top prospect or two to get this team better? Do we keep going here? Do we think do that's the wise but, thing to do? But what do they go get? Because they were supposed to have a great rotation. They were supposed to have an unbelievable lineup. They have Hayter back in, and their bullpen was supposed to be dominant, as we saw it was in the postseason last year against the Dodgers. So what – what do they need? Because Preller, I think it's yeah, it bullpen help. Of, the bullpen is thin. And them and every every Ka- other team. Sanchez seemingly has solved the catcher position for now, but that's a long term need for sure. They could use help. They could use another starter too. There's not like guarantees there with any of these guys. Darvish has had injury issues of late. There's always ways to get better, AJ. You know that, but it seems to me. And the feeling around the industry is when you go this far, as the Padres have, when you're this all in, you have no choice but to keep going. And that's a really dangerous place to be because they've essentially stripped the system already. They've got more guys coming, and they can always trade someone else. Jackson Merrill is the next in line. But that is, a again, dangerous game to play because ultimately you're going to need some young players. And most of their best young players, we're seeing them in Washington right now. Well, who would you rather be then? Okay, the Padres? who are all the way committed, right? Or a team like, let's use the Cubs, who we just saw this weekend, that are kind of in that middle area where are we in? Are we competing? Are we rebuilding? What are we doing? What's the next step? So which team would you rather be? If I'm a fan, going into the season, the Padres, right? But look at the way it's played out. For whatever reason there, it's not working. Or at least it has not worked to this point. The Cubs, it's not really working there either. They've been kind of an up-and-down, mediocre team, but they have some young players coming. They've developed some. Justin Steele's an all-star, homegrown guy. There is something to what they're doing. It's a logical progression. Now, you want them to spend more money, but they're starting to. Stroman the one year, Dansby Swanson this year, Seiya Suzuki, they've added some pieces. They signed Happ and Horner to extensions. It's not totally blank there. And... Granted, they do need, as we discussed on the broadcast, another big bat. Their top guy in OPS outside of Morrell, who hasn't qualified, is Ian Happ, and he ranks something like 68th in OPS in the majors. So, sure, they are not all the way there, but the problem with the Padres is if they don't win now with Soto or the next couple of years, Soto is one more year left after this one, all their players are getting older. Tatis, granted, will be moving into his prime, but I'm talking about Bogarts and Machado. This might be it, folks, right? Blake Snell's a free agent. Josh Hader's a free agent. You can sign all these guys? I'm not so sure that's going to work out for them. Yeah. Uh, no, some of those moves we talked about, Cronenworth, like Darvish, gave him a lot of years at his age, you know, away from free agency. It was Those were the ones that were interesting to me versus some, you know, versus Machado and, and trading for Soto. So let's finish with this to tie it right into the Mets because you wrote about them last week. I loved seeing, hey, where's Verlander going? Where's Scherzer going? I mean, they have the same record as the Padres, 38 and 46. Both of those teams are eight games back. And you've said this all year on this show and on Fair Territory. And we talk Cardinals, Padres, Mets, probably more than any other teams right now around the trade deadline. Those three teams, maybe one in my mind at this point makes the playoffs. So on the Mets side of things, can you run through your thought process when you were putting that article together on how realistic it is that some of those stars could be dealt and this could be great for the Mets to build their farm system if they're really not going to make the playoffs this year because they need help there too? It's complicated. 
And the Mets don't have great potential free agents like the Padres do, or even the Cardinals. Jordan Montgomery and Hicks and Flaherty, they're not great, but they'll bring you something if you indeed decide to trade them. The Mets' potential free agent list is not at that level. Most of their guys are signed. Where this gets interesting is if they are indeed willing to trade Scherzer and or Verlander, but that is where it gets complicated too. Both of those guys, full no trade clauses. So what that means is they can effectively direct where they want to go. Scherzer did that when he was traded from the Nationals to the Dodgers. He basically picked off teams and ultimately decided he wanted to be a Dodger. He became a Dodger. With those guys, that's only one complicating factor. Scherzer also has an opt-out after this year. What if he doesn't take the opt-out? Who pays for that year? Verlander has a conditional player option for 2025. If he throws 140 innings next year and is healthy, he can exercise his option for 25. That's more money. Who, again, takes care of all this? And I talked to a GM this weekend who thought, well, Cohen can pay down the salaries this year, but beyond that, he's not going to do it. I don't know. I don't know what he's thinking. And he has said he considers that money already spent, so he's willing to do some things to effectively buy prospects. They could shake up the deadline. I'm not sure they're going to. David Robertson is the one potential free agent. I should mention him. But they're going to try to, to get back in contention, too. They won two or three just now from the Giants. Nothing great there. It's a nice series win, but for them, it's like a monumental achievement, the way they've been playing. Let's see where they are in two weeks. Let's see where they are in three weeks and right up to the deadline because a lot of these decisions are going to go right down to the end. Yep. And for a trade deadline that looks like it's a little thin on starting pitching, oof, start throwing out Scherzer's name and maybe even Verlander. It'd be wild. That would make it from what some are calling like maybe a little more of a boring trade deadline to a super lit trade deadline. So I It's hope. never boring, Scott. I've never believed it would be boring the whole time. Things happen and... The GMs in general, the clubs, they don't sit still. They're always trying. They're always thinking of doing things. And we might not see Juan Soto get traded, somebody at that level. But if we see a Scherzer go again, that's pretty interesting right there. Oh, hell yeah. Going into the season, no one would have saw that. 